uh, Janet Myers Northrup, who wrote a book that looks like this. Uh, and she's going to tell us all about it. Janet Myers Northrup was raised in Jamestown, where she attended family events at the consistory, now the Robert H. Jackson Center. Her father and grandfather were Masons. Janet taught English language arts in Fairport, New York. She wrote the book, Founding Women, Inspiration and Impact on Chautauqua and the Nation for the Chautauqua Women's Club. Janet, you're from Jamestown. I sure am. And uh, as I understand, our paths actually crossed without me knowing our paths had crossed. Yes, Greg, we, we grew up on the same street on Allendale Avenue, right behind Allen Park. Oh. Things I learned while she was writing this book yeah. is that she was within, what, three or four houses from That's right. But you were just a younger one. So. And we're not going to delve into that at yeah. all. That's not our subject. Yeah. So anybody who's really curious about uh, myself as a very young child in Allen Park, uh, don't ask. <laughs> the book called A House Preserving History for uh, 150 Years, the Robert H. Jackson Center. So this is the book. It's uh, going to be available as you're leaving today. It's cool. I must tell you it's cool because... Here's when she approached us about the book and uh, discussed it with Riley Kidder and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and she showed us the galley of it all. I had no idea. And I've been giving tours for almost 20 years about this building. And these folks here in the front row are <coughs> taking notes, Janet, because they are the docents of the Jackson Center to figure out what they've been saying for the last 20 years bears any semblance to reality. <laughs> So we're here to uh, gather that, that moment. Uh, so we thank you because this is a book not on the history of the center as a corporate entity and program. This is a book on the building, the building, uh, literally from 1860 forward. And I can't tell you how thankful we are because this adds so much value to the Jackson Center story. Well, I really enjoy doing it. I like history. I've always enjoyed it. I taught. English for 34 years, but I tried to do junior English, which was history, so I could still do a little bit of history in there. The um, house actually um, had five different owners, we'll say. It was built by the Kents, uh, a statistic that I think many of you are already familiar with. And then um, the second owner, I found was a woman. I was really amazed by that. 1888, she was married. Her name was, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. <laughs> uh, Rose uh, Elena um, Hall Wetmore Kent. And she was I'd be nervous with that kind of name too. Yeah, exactly. oh, but her husband, um, uh, lived here with her, and she had they had a, a son who grew up here as well. But she owned the house. She also owned about five or six other properties in Jamestown. Uh, and I can talk to you more about her later on. And then the third owner uh, was her son by her first marriage. And he was a very interesting person. You, I hope everybody received a copy of this uh, handout that was on the table. If not, ask Dave, put your hand up uh, in good uh, classroom fashion and he'll give you a copy, he's back there. So the third owner was Charles Delavan Wetmore. He was part of an architectural firm in New York City called Warren and Wetmore. And they designed about 300 buildings in New York City, including Grand Central Terminal. And they came up with the idea for the three arches that are kind of iconic for, for that building. They also did a library in Louvain and in uh, Belgium. They did the um, um, ho oh, beautiful hotels in Hawaii, Colorado Springs, uh, apartments. Uh, they did many buildings. And he was the one who was responsible for the woodwork in this building. Um, the uh, last, uh, second, the next owner was the consistory, and they owned the building between 1920 and 2001, <coughs> and finally, of course, it became the Jackson Center in 2003. 
Talk about Alonzo Kent. He, in the beginning, there was no building here. It was just a empty space, and yeah. so uh, a property owned by some people named Gray, and they had been living uh, on Spring Street, and then they decided to build a very fancy house. In fact, this is considered to be the first permanent uh, residence uh, in Jamestown from the standpoint that it was a brick building. Of course, back then they still had outhouses that they didn't get inside plumbing until later on. But um, he had um, an architect we think was uh, another man by the name of Hall. But we don't, uh, I didn't find any specific references that Hall was really the one that built it, but uh, that designed it. But the, uh, he was in the area. He built later on many of the churches. He designed the, um, the Congregational Church. He designed the old First Methodist Church at the end of Third Street. Of course, First Lutheran Church he did, and many other churches in the area at Westfield and in Randolph. He was self-taught, never went to school for that. He read magazines, and he learned about uh, Italian uh, architecture, uh, which was the Italiente with the windows that have uh, metal around them and a cupola at the top. This building did have a cupola at one point. Um, he was uh, just an amazing architect. I, I, to think of somebody who really was basically self-taught to be able to design a house of this type. Four years later, uh, the business partner of Alonzo Kent, Reuben Fenton, probably liked this house so much he decided to have his own brick house bigger on a much bigger parcel of land than this one. I think they were rivals. I read one place that they were good friends, but Alonzo Kent was the only person who could really tell Reuben Fenton off and get away with it. Uh, when um, Alonzo Kent arrived in Jamestown uh, in uh, the early 1830s, he probably took the Erie Canal, which had opened in 1825, got to Buffalo, then they would take a packet boat down to Barcelona, and then a, uh, a well, like a carriage into uh, Jamestown. And he went to the brand new opened um, Temperance Hotel, which was owned by a man by the name of Rice. He thought Alonzo seemed like a, a nice young man, even though he had no money whatsoever, and he allowed him to stay in the hotel with the idea that eventually he would have money and he could pay his bill. He was served in the dining room by Rice, the, the, um, the owner's um, daughter, who was 18 years old at the time, and a couple of years later, Alonzo and Mercy Rice Kent got married. She had noticed that he had very good handwriting, and she had told him, oh, many people in Jamestown would love to learn how to write the way that you write. Why don't you open a school? And she is the one who went out and got many friends to sign up to learn good penmanship, and within a couple of days, he had money in his pocket. And he had no idea, I'm sure, when he arrived in Jamestown that he was going to stay here. He came from Vermont, from a place called Royalton, Vermont. One of the interesting um, articles that I read in, in uh, researching this was a recently published um, a diary that was kept between 1854 and 1860 by a man living in New Hampshire named Reverend Jewett. He visited Royalton, Vermont, the place where Alonzo Kent came from, met him. He was so impressed with him, he wrote a whole page or two in his diary about Alonzo Kent. And what he said was, he had met Alonzo. Alonzo, he said, went out west. All he had was a handkerchief with a few items in it. And he earned so much money, he was worth $125,000. I don't know how he came up with that statistic, but he did. <laughs> and he said that he was such a good son, Alonzo came back every year to visit his parents. 
that his parents were illiterate. And here he was with his beautiful penmanship. But the parents were illiterate. They didn't have any money, so he paid for their room in a, in a house where they were living. And he also was a, a person who went to Chicago when Abraham Lincoln was nominated for president. He was at the convention for nominating um, Lincoln. So there are many things that are interesting about him as well. Uh, some of the articles said that he was a Presbyterian, but there was a problem in the Methodist Church with the choir. They needed more sing singers. He liked to sing, so he joined the Methodists, <laughs> and he stayed. As I said, he had deep pockets, so whenever he would, uh, whenever the church needed money, and they were doing a project, Rotary could use somebody like this, they would just um, ask him, and he would always fill in the rest of the money that they needed. One of the things the Methodist Church wanted to do was buy property on Chautauqua Lake or some lake where the people from the various churches and other denominations could go and recreate to have, to have some relaxation and to enjoy the, the water. So the, uh, the church actually um, solicited money from the various congregations and uh, it was Alonzo who gave them $10,000, which was enough money to build, to buy the property. Well, about the same time, a year later, uh, Miller and Vincent um, were also looking for property, and they found the one that had the Methodist Church had just bought. And so they decided that they should all work together. And Miller and Vincent started putting money into the campgrounds and uh, eventually uh, they bought it for a dollar, according to one of the sources. And that's, so you can thank Alonzo Kent for the money that originally went into buying the land, which is now Chautauqua Institution. You know, that's stuff I had no clue about. And the big, he builds this wonderful building, and, and could you explain what, what this place looked like in, say, 1870, 75? The, the way that we can really know something about them is in 1888 when it changed hands. Now, back when it was built in 1858, I, I have seen pictures, and in fact, the book has uh, one picture from that time period. Um, the um, rooms at, at one place in the, actually it was in the, the records of the consistory, said that the rooms were done in two shades of green um, for the most part. <coughs> And um, it was uh, a good property. It, 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 actually, this has always been an excellent location here in Jamestown. The rooms were big. Uh, back when, in 1875, when um, Miller and Vincent thought in the second year of Chautauqua that they should have a prominent speaker come, they, um, had, um, they finally decided Ulysses S. Grant should uh, be the speaker that summer. And so they uh, sent the minister from the Jamestown Methodist Church at the time, Flood, to interview um, the president who was in New Jersey vacationing at Long Branch Island, and he agreed to come to Chautauqua. They thought that he would eat at the home of Reuben Fenton when he got off the train. They didn't know that Ulysses Grant had a real feud with Reuben Fenton because Fenton had backed Horace Greeley in the 1872 election, and Grant had really bad feelings about that. So Grant said, well, we don't need to stop in Jamestown. We can just go up the lake, right? They said, no, no, we're going to stop for lunch at least. So Flood said to uh, the president, uh, oh, we can stop at the Alonzo Kent house for lunch. Uh, I'm sure that, that they would like you to do that. He didn't know, he, did, he had never asked them if they would interview, if they would have the president come. And they uh, actually, Kent said, no, I, I don't want him to come because our house is not good enough. So in his own mind, maybe he was modest, but it was, I think, the nicest house before the Fenton uh, building went up. So there was a residence there, and then there was green space. And then where we are today was what? 
Well, there was, a, a, when Rose uh, Kent took over, she loved flowers. She was involved with the Rose Gardens, which was an amazing uh, flower um, buildings up in Lakewood where they sold flowers and different kinds of flowers all over the country. Um, she, um, uh, let's see, he, um, uh, let's see. <coughs> Sorry, forgot. Well, at this building, at this particular building where we're in, really was the livery stable, right? Actually, um, the, this, where we're sitting right now was the stables. And when the uh, consistory took over in 1920, the first project they did was right in this room. They took out the horse stables. There was a ramp that went up to Fifth Street. And then there was the carriage house. And the car on the first floor, that's where the main carriages that they kept were. And then they had another uh, floor above there where they kept the carriages that they used once in a while. So you are actually in uh, the stables now um, before they renovated and put the kitchen in. They wanted to do that because the, the consistory wanted to have um, more degrees um, given to the people that were involved with masonry. So they needed to have the facility to do that. So they used this room from the very beginning, certainly by 1922. So a little bit back to the uh, Rose Kent. Mm -hmm. She married a gentleman by the name of, uh, yeah, she was, her husband was Elba Kent. Her, her second, second husband, husband was yeah. Elba. Her first husband was um, a graduate of Union College. He worked on railroads. He was an engineer. He worked on uh, oil in western um, Pennsylvania. Uh, unfortunately, he developed tuberculosis. So in 1865-66, in he went to Florida for the winter. And the following year, he was somewhat improved, was out riding in his carriage. The horses were spooked by something, overturned the wagon. He actually died not from tuberculosis, but from a carriage accident. And they left her at age 29 with a fortune because she inherited the whole fortune of the Wetmore family. Um, the father had been a judge. Before that, they were involved with lumber and timber, and they had they made their fortune that way. So that's how um, she she first earned her fortune, and then she married um, Elba Kent. Now Elba Kent um, was um, a nephew of Alonzo Kent. He, when he did not come to Jamestown originally. When he left Royalton, Vermont, he went to Wisconsin. And he worked in a hospital there. But within two or three months, the Civil War broke out. So he signed up with the Wisconsin um, Brigade. And he ended up being in the Army for four years. He took 60 days off one time, but they, they weren't involved in any battles at that point. But uh, he was a, uh, came in as a second lieutenant, then he was a first lieutenant. Uh, so many people were killed in his regiment, although he was never wounded, he was never captured. Uh, he became a captain for a while, but he never used that rank. He always said that he was a first lieutenant. He was really involved with Civil War veterans groups after the Civil War. He moved to Jamestown and he, and then to Cory, Pennsylvania. And in Cory, he and his brother, A. Flynn Kent, um, started um, wood, different kinds of, of uh, businesses involving either gas or wood, making wood products and furniture. And he also started the gas works in Warren, Pennsylvania. And when he was there, that's when he met Rose um, Wetmore, who was a widow, as I said, and living in Warren with her. She had uh, uh, a couple of sons at that point, a daughter who had died, but she was still living in Warren. So they got married, and then they moved across the border to Jamestown, and both of them spent the rest of their lives there. She was actually born in Busti, and her uh, 
parents had been uh, farmers and big landowners. Her grandfather and another uncle were uh, farmers, and in fact, they owned, um, I one source said, the largest farm in um, Chautauqua County after she inherited those three farms. Uh, Elba also was an entrepreneur and uh, a hotelier. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about that because we have some people from Lakewood. Okay. Here. Well, he started the Kent Hotel that those of you, uh, everybody in the area knows where the, where the uh, Lakewood um, Yacht Club is, and that was where this Kent Hotel was. Uh, that originally it had 250 rooms, and then it went up to 500 rooms. Um, it burned down, um, as was the fate for most of the big hotels on the lake. Uh, I think by the time it burned and two other people took over and they did the second um, Kent House um, on that same property. He, by then, he got involved with raising cattle. Uh, there was a new kind of um, cow that had, uh, had been um, entering, had come to the United States from Scotland in the 1870s called the Black Angus. And at that time, there were no Black Angus in the whole country until they brought in four of them. And they were in Kansas, but eventually people realized it was a really good um, meat producer. And so um, it became um, uh, growing in popularity. There is a, a, a Cattlemen's Association, and I assume that he was part of the original Cattlemen's Association. And I did check uh, with that, them, and they said all of their records were burned, so they don't know if he was a part of the, that original group or not. There were four farms in New York State in the 1870s that raised uh, Black Angus cattle, and one of them was in Chautauqua County, and that was Elba Kent's. Um, and then another one was in Batavia, another one was um, Central New York, and the last one was in New York City, it said. No, oh, I can imagine. Rose Kent, I'm reading this now, <coughs> was actively involved in the First Congregational Church until 1893, but eventually converted to a new faith tradition. In 1886, the founder of the First Church of Christ, scientist Mary Baker Eddy, sent one of her students to guide people who were interested in the new religion. In 1891, the student Sarah Clark conducted her the first public service in Jamestown. The next year, Rose Kent purchased the property Caddy Corner from here, 321 Prendergast Street, and they constructed a church. That's right. And the stones that were used <laughs> all came from the Kent Farm um, in Bustai. And this was a, a project that she thought was really important. And in fact, both here and at the church, they say there was a passageway that went from the basement here over to the Church of uh, Christ Scientist. Um, she was the first reader for the church, and she was um, uh, the, really the finances behind that particular building. Um, when she died, um, the, she was buried um, in Lakeview Cemetery, where all of the Kents are buried. But here, when you're in the front hall here, remember her casket was there with flowers all the way to the ceiling, they say. She was very devout in that church. Her husband was a Unitarian. As it said, a good friend of the Unitarian Church. By the way, if you go into the basement today, and I don't recommend it, but if you go down in the basement, <laughs> there is in the far corner underneath the, by the porch is, in fact, an archway on the floor. An archway on the floor, which would lead one to believe, to confirm everything you've said, that, in fact, there was a passageway from here to someplace. We assume it's over there. They said that it was over there, and they pointed to the wall where it was. Yeah, this is going to debunk that whole uh, abolitionist type thing. No, I don't. This was, no, I don't think this was in, uh, part Sorry of. Sorry, guys, program. this is going to blow our story right, <laughs> right out the window, because uh, we do know that Elba, uh, or, uh, uh, Alonzo Kent was in fact an abolitionist. He, he did support that, and um, anyways, long long sidebar story. Uh, among just just out of curiosity, she was also a uh, friend friend of the arts. So when some of the actors and actresses from New York City were barnstorming, they found their way not only to the city, but also here. And it was, her, or it was really her son um, who was um, living in New York City. 
he was a bachelor for until he was probably in his late 40s. He knew a lot of the movie stars, and uh, whenever uh, acting troops or celebrities came to the Allen uh, Opera House and later the Samuels Opera House, and then the today we know it's the Lucy Center. Uh, the, um, they, they would be invited here. I found two specific references to um, two of the actresses that came here. One was Lillian Russell, uh, who was, um, and, and there's a little write-up about her because I, in, in the book because I didn't know much about her. But she, she actually did the, when um, they did the first broadcast using, um, between New York and uh, Boston, she did, she sang a song, and so she had the first voice recorded in in that, that um, telephone uh, with Bell. And then um, the other one was um, Ethel Barrymore. Ethel Barrymore, who um, was very popular at the time and is the matriarch of that whole clan of actors that are still acting today. Bill Larson probably knows the answer to this question, but. Uh, the actual song that uh, Lillian Russell sang for Alexander Graham Bell in May 8, 1880 was the Sabre Song. Did you have that, Bill? Or you knew that, didn't you? You were that time period. <laughs> uh, so they, then after they died, after uh, uh, ultimately Elba died, and then the property came in the hands of Charles Wetmore uh, for a short period of time. Very short period of time. Uh, his um, friends, um, the Watrises would come here to visit, uh, but Mr. Watrous um, had a, a girlfriend, I guess, and decided that he didn't want to be married any longer. So a couple of years later, um, the uh, Charles um, married her, and so they lived here for only two years. Um, and the dates varied. I found some said 1917 to 1917, 18, and then they bought a house at Long Point. And one of the things that's not in the book because um, I didn't think I had to do with the house enough was uh, Mrs. Um, was Watrous is now um, I can't, um, Wetmore. Um, she, her daughter decided, when her daughter decided to marry the head of the Canadian National Railroad, a man by the name of Thompson, there were 18 railroad cars parked along the railroad tracks on the, on the east side um, of, the, of Jamestown going out here to all the way to Long Point. There was a huge <coughs> wedding with many people arriving in private um, railroad cars. By the way, for those, we're not gonna, time will not permit this crazy story, uh, but you gotta buy the book. Uh, dealing with Elba Kent Jr. So don't talk about it because I want him to buy the book. But it's an amazing uh, forgery story that became international. Uh, the ultimately Charles Wetmore sells it to a fraternal organization <laughs> called the Scottish Rite Consistory. His brother was a uh, half brother was uh, this was the uh, child of um, um, Elba and um, and um, Rose. Uh, his name was Morgan Bostwick Kent. He was married, he um, owned a house that's next door to the Elks on 5th Street. It's now a parking lot, I understand. He didn't want this house because he already had a house. He liked this house. So that's why it went to um, his brother. But he, um, uh, Morgan Boswick Kent was a, a Mason. And I think when, they, when the Masons decided that they had outgrown um, the the uh, place that they had on, um, Main, on Main Street, they decided that this would be the, the perfect place, and I think he encouraged them to buy the house. So the Scottish Rite Consistory bought the house for how much? Um, I, I think it was twenty thousand okay. dollars. And so they they buy this place, which at the time again had green space, livery stable, residence, and they then do some conversion here, mainly. Here, they, they used the carriage house, and they, then they brought in, the record said 12 feet of dirt to create the uh, auditorium space. 
but they decided that they would not do much with the rest of the house. They're the ones that researched it and found out about the two shades of green for the, the wall cover. But they, they really did not use much of the house. They um, used this area a lot and the theater, of course, um, for the uh, backdrops and the coffins and things they would use for some of their rituals. Did they raise the uh, roof? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they had to, to raise it. I understand you did <coughs> renovations on that within a few, few years ago. Did we, we, we did? Lots of money. <laughs> Lots of money. Yeah. Uh, all of that. So they, 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 had, they built this sort of, there are several additions that sort of went from the house <laughs> to here when you walk in, the entryway and you turn left. Yeah. There's some apartments above. I think, as I recall, there was sort of a patchwork of stuff down there. I think so. Um, yeah, I know there was an uh, apartment because you interviewed somebody who lived, John Fuchs, who lived in that apartment. He said that um, uh, it was the wiring. John Fuchs <laughs> got uh, got the idea that if he would give, if he would do the new wiring of the auditorium, and the the wires apparently were just crumbling in his hands when he would work with them because they were so old. Um, that he, if they would give him a place to live for free, then he would do the wiring for free. So that's how a lot of that wiring was done in the 1970s. Um, he did say what, at one point that he found a playbill which had Lucille Ball's name on it, and so he thought maybe Lucy might have performed on the stage. But a um, year ago, Greg interviewed a um, gentleman at Chautauqua who looked into Lucy's visit um, in Jamestown and found absolutely Lucille Ball performed on this stage in this building and when she was here for the Forever Darling preview, I think it was 1959, she, they said, what would you like to see in Jamestown? She said, the consistory. So they brought her here and she looked at the black and white floors and looked at the theater and met with some of the people who had been on stage here with her. Well, the Rotary said the same thing. They, they, they preferred to be here, too. <laughs> so that we, we think that's the Lucille Ball Rotary, thank you. Uh, the consistory, you have a co personal connection to this building. What's yeah, that? My personal connection was um, not with Robert H. Jackson Center, but uh, my father would, and my whole family, my brother, sister, and I would come here for um, consistory meetings and it amazes me now, but the kids were turned loose during the meetings. We would have dinner and then, um, so when I was maybe six, seven years old, I would explore all the rooms in this house and uh, with several other kids. I remember kids of different ages, kind of looking out for each other. We found the billiard room on the second floor. And that's really where I learned to shoot pool because <laughs> the older kids would say, no, you can't ever, ever make holes in, in the belt. And, and they show, they would show us the cue sticks and the, the uh, chalk and, and yeah, talk about angles. There must have been like 10 or 11 year olds that were very knowledgeable pool players. <laughs> so, uh, so when I was at talk, when I would go to the lectures that were offered on the Jackson Center, and I learned where the Jackson Center was, I thought, i got to go see that building. <laughs> so I did, and I, I took two tours of the building with the docents, and people really know what you're talking about. Very interesting. And from after talking with you, that's when I, would, I went over many times to the um, Hall Research Center, where they were really helpful, too. Well, what you've, what you've accomplished is something which uh, we just sort of dreamed about, learning more about the facility. In fact, I think the, what we've had, the docents have had as a basis point, is an uh, article written by Sarita Weeks. Oh, yes. Uh, Sarita Weeks, Stan Weeks' uh, widow, uh, very active in the Scottish Rite consistory as a, cause Stan was the 33rd degree mason. Uh, the she, highest you can be. Yeah, she was very much active involved in the and the degree work, you know, all the costumes that they were wearing at the various degrees was really Sarita. So she took it upon herself to, to write a piece. That's probably what we've been working off of for some time. Uh, you, yes. You've added value. What's the big, what's the big 
surprise as you endeavored to do this book uh, and a kind of aha moment saying, I had no idea. Uh, I really, I think it's the, the people that have been here. Um, as Riley Kidder pointed out, you had a uh, president of the United States who was in this building, who was the head of the executive. You had John Roberts, the head of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, so head of the, of the judiciary. Um, you have had uh, four Supreme Court justices here. I was fascinated that uh, as it became the Jackson Center, the important people that have been here, um, especially I think Linda, Linda Brown and also the Barnett sisters, because I taught for so many years, uh, the Brown case, uh, Brown versus Board of Education 54, Topeka, Kansas, was one of those case studies everybody uh, in school learns about. And to find the connection here and that she's been here and, that, and then spoke at Chautauqua, uh, and you have the pictures of her, um, that really meant a lot. And I was surprised to see that. And also the Barnett sisters, um, every once in a while, I would have students in my homeroom that refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, according to that decision, the Barnett decision, they were um, children of um, Jehovah's Witnesses. It was against their faith tradition to take a pledge. And um, uh, indeed, the kid, uh, the students, I would tell them, I said, you, nobody's forcing you to say the Pledge of Allegiance but you do have to be respectful for everybody else that's saying it. But the Barnett sisters have been here as well. And soon we'll have uh, the Korematsu family here oh, next month. Wonderful. Uh, C-SPAN will be coming here oh, as well. Wow. And I think we're all thrilled to know that we can add to that list of dignitaries and luminaries who have been here, uh, Janet Myers Northrop. So oh, to Janet, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>